We are so happy you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. If this message touches you in any way, let us know about it. You can email pray at jesusotherock.org or you can look us up on Facebook or Twitter, Church on the Rock, Pascagoula. If you would like to know how our ministries are touching the lives of others, you can go to jesusotherock.org. While you're there, consider fueling our passion to reach the lost and the unsaved by giving to us. You can click on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen of our website. Again, thank you for joining us and welcome to Church on the Rock. Short and sweet today, and it doesn't sound like it because I'm going to talk about eight things. <laughs> I know that's scary when somebody says that, but we're going to fly through these eight things quickly. Actually, I thought of another one on the way home, so I think I'm going to give you nine. Uh, in between services, I thought about another one. But Hebrews chapter nine, real quickly, verse 27, it says, And just as each person is destined to die once, after that comes the judgment. The King James reads like this, for it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. It's appointed. That's a funeral scripture. We use it in funerals a lot of times, and when I use it in a funeral, I talk about appointments. We have an appointment with death, every one of us. I work with hospice over in Mobile, and we use the word terminal a lot, and the word terminal comes up, and the doctors say, uh, this is terminal, and I look at them and laugh. I say, listen to me, sweetheart. We're all terminal. Every one of us are terminal. The, the death rate hovers right up there around 100%. We all have an appointment with death. It is appointed unto man once to die. Well, when I talk about this in funerals, a lot of times I'll talk about appointments. We have appointments all, every day with our attorneys or with our bankers or with our friends or with our doctors or with our dentists. And I like to talk about dentist appointments because I don't know if you do this or if this is just me. But if I have a dentist appointment coming up about three days out, I'll start brushing my teeth like nobody's business. <laughs> Y'all do that? Or excuse me, start flossing? You know, every day you're flossing. Hadn't flossed in six months, but I'm flossing. I don't know why I want to impress this dentist, but something in me wants to get ready for this appointment. When he looks and he says, hey, these are looking good. I think, yeah, you should have seen them three days ago. <laughs> but there's something about, I want to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I like to get prepared for my appointment. And, and usually when I'm talking about funerals, I talk about we have an appointment with death. The prophet Amos said, prepare to meet your God. So we have something that we need to do to prepare us to meet the Lord. All of us have an appointment with death. Um, now here it says, just as each person is destined to die or it's appointed to die, and, and most of the time during funerals and things, I focus on that. We have an appointment with death. But today, I want to focus on the last part of this. It says, and after that comes the judgment. I want to talk about after that, after this. We put a lot of focus on this. What am I going to do? What did I do yesterday? All my problems. Oh, I've got this. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I know all that's this. You know what Jesus said one time? He said, all this is like a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. It's like steam coming out of a pot. Ooh, ah, it's gone. And that's what this, that's what this is. But after this, there's something else. And according to this, after this, there will be a judgment of some kind, a day of reckoning, if you will, judgment day. I don't, I don't think that should scare us, but it should certainly we give us some attention to this. If there's going to be a judgment day, if there's going to be a day when I'm going to be judged, if there's going to be a day that I'm going to stand before God, then I want to be prepared for that day. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about eight or nine questions that I believe God will not ask on Judgment Day. I don't know what all he will ask. I don't know if he'll ask anything or if he will just hand down a verdict. I don't know if, but, and I don't know that he won't ask, but there's some things. This is a Rogerism sermon, okay? I can't prove to you that this is what God will or will not do. I can't prove it. But this is eight or nine things that I believe God will not ask 
on Judgment Day. So, let's dive in. Number one, I don't believe that God will ask, were you a church member? Paul said, I desire to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I don't think God will ask. Now, do I believe God wants us and expects us to be part of a church body? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you go over into the book of Acts, and I'm not going to read it this morning, uh, but, but if you read about the very first church, it talks about how they came together and they learned from the apostles' doctrine and teaching and they met together in one another's house and they broke bread and they come together and they had the Lord's Supper and it said God added to the church in one day 3,000 people and then God added to the church daily such as was being saved. He says uh, for Take not the assembling yourselves together, even more so as you see the day approaching. Encourage one another in the Lord. There's, there's something about coming together as a body, and I think that God has given us that not so much as a command, but as a gift, that we come together and we encourage each other as we have family, and this is family, and white family, and black family, and Hispanic family, and Mexican family, Ben, I've got you covered. We have family. You know, we're family. We're, 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 we're brothers with different mothers. But understand that your church membership is not your ticket to heaven. In fact, your church membership has very little to do with the after this part. Our church membership has to do with the this part. It has to do with our life here today. It's not about getting us into heaven it's not about the afterlife. It's about this present life. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I need the house of the Lord. I need my brothers and sisters in Christ. I need, I can't tell you how sad it is when the funeral home calls me or I have a family that I work with in hospice and what if somebody dies and they say, can you do the funeral? Why? Because nobody in the family has a pastor. Nobody in the family has a pastor. We don't have a church. There's no, you know, we, when, when somebody dies or somebody's sick or somebody, and listen, we have people fall through the cracks. That's one of the things we're working on right now is trying to make sure that people don't fall through the cracks. If somebody's sick, if somebody's in the hospital, that somebody's there to take care of them, somebody's there to minister to them. When somebody loses a loved one, that their family, that their body is there. We need the church. We need our body. But it's not our ticket into heaven. And it's not about what church you belong to. It's not about what name is. A, you can call your church Pork and Bean Cathedral. It doesn't matter if as long as you're worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. It's not about your church membership, not the after this. Number two, and they're all not going to be that long, I promise. We're going to get quicker as we go here. I don't think God will be asking you what kind of car you drove. I don't think he cares. I don't think you get extra points for driving a jalopy or penalized for driving a Porsche. Somebody this morning after first service, they got ready to leave and they got in this brand new shiny Corvette. And they rolled up and pulled down the window and said, I'm so glad you said Porsche, not Corvette. I thought I was going to have to sell it. <laughs> they just bought it. You're not penalized or vice versa. Now, what he may ask is something like, were you willing to give someone a ride in that car? Were you willing to go by and pick somebody up that didn't have a car in that car that you had, for better, for worse? I don't care what you drove. I tell people all the time, if your car is too good to stop and pick up some snotty-nosed kid and bring them to church on Sunday, your car's probably too good. You need to sell it and get one that you can use for God's glory. He may ask what you did with what I blessed you with, not what type you had. I don't believe that God's going to be asking about the house you lived in. I don't think he's going to ask, did you rent or did you own? How many square foot was in your house? What he may ask is, was your house a place where people were welcome? to come and to fellowship and to break bread? Was your house a place of refuge? Was your, house, was your house a place of comfort or a place of conflict? 
Was your house a house of prayer? Was your house a house of turmoil? What was your house like? I want to borrow number four from my friend, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I don't think God's going to be asking about the color of your skin. What he may ask is about the content of your character. He may ask you about, you know, what, what kind of life, what kind of character you had. Romans 10, 12 says there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for the same God is rich in mercy to all who call upon him. It's not about black, white, brown, yellow, green, whatever. It's about what our relationship is with Christ. I hate prejudice. I've hated it for as long as I can remember. I hate it in the workplace. I hate it in the school. I hate it on the job site. But the place I hate it most is the place that is still the most prevalent in church at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. And it's still the most segregated hour in America. And I think that breaks the heart of God that the church should be leading the charge and the church is still dragging up the rear. I hate words like black church, white church, Hispanic church, Baptist church, Pentecostal church, Methodist church. There's not but one church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Somehow we decided we get to divvy up and name these and do this and have our own little cliques. I don't think God's going to care. Number five, I don't think God's going to ask about what kind of neighborhood you lived in. Whether you lived in the upper class, or the lower class, or the middle class, or the no class, or the, my favorite is the upper middle. I like the upper middle. Say, so where do you live? Well, all right, we're upper middle. We're not, we're not upper, but we're better than middle, you know. We're upper middle. I don't think God really cares about what kind of neighborhood you live in, what class neighborhood you lived in. I, 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 I do think that it's possible there may be a few questions concerning how you treated your neighbor. According to everything I read and study in the scripture, there's a lot about our neighbors. And we know that our neighbors are not just who lives beside us, but our neighbors are everybody that comes in contact with. Everybody that's around us, everybody there. Did you care about your neighbors? Did you, how did you treat people, not just in word, but in deed? How did you treat people in your neighborhood? How did you treat people that are around you? Number six, I don't believe God's going to ask about how long you've been saved. Why didn't you get saved earlier? Why did you waste so much of your life? I don't believe that God's going to ask that. There was a thief on the cross who never did anything right. And in his dying breath, he said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Jesus said, buddy, this day you'll be with me in paradise. This very day. Do I suggest waiting until your dying day? No, I don't. But I don't believe that it's going to make any difference in the after this. Now, what I think he may ask concerning the timing is, what have you done since you've been saved? What have you done since you've become a believer? Since you've become a follower of me, what have you done since you've accepted Jesus Christ? Have you shared your faith with anybody? Have you ever invited someone to come worship with you? Really? You're a follower of me? You're a ble- Imagine with me for a moment if we lived in a land of famine. There's no food. Money can't buy food. It's gone. We're hungry. But, but there's, there's one person, you know, Carl Nolta, he's got a warehouse. Because Carl, Carl knew it was coming, and Carl's got a, but he's got it camouflaged. Nobody knows about it. And Carl just slips out there on Sunday morning and goes in, and he, still, he just eats, and he lays back in the lap of luxury, and, and then he gets back out, and he goes back out, and he just rubs shoulders with the rest of the world until he sees them dying off one by one. Hate it for you, buddy. That's really tough. Sad. Isn't that what we do with the gospel? We sneak in on Sunday mornings. We come in here and we eat and we eat. We say, oh, pastor just fed me today. I just got good. And then we go out in the world and people that work beside us don't even know we're saved. Well, we've got the food. We've got what the world needs. We've got the answer to the world's problems and we don't do anything with it. I believe that's what God may ask us about. Why didn't you share what I blessed you with? I forgave you. What did you do with what I gave you? I don't believe God's going to ask you, number seven, about your favorite foods. 
That was a big deal in the Old Testament. You can eat this and you can't eat that, and you, you know, you this is acceptable and that's not, or you do. I, I do think God may ask something like, Who did you feed who had no food? What did you do with those who were hungry? One time Jesus said, I'm gonna sit the people he called goats on one side and the sheep over here. And I'm going to say to the sheep, enter in my good and faithful servant. Why? Because I was hungry. You fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was sick. You came and visited me. I was naked. You gave me clothes. When, Lord? When did we do that? He said, when you did it to the least of them, you did it to me. And the others on the other side, he says, and you're going to be cast away. Why, Lord? Why would we be cast away? Because I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was naked. When? When did we see you hungry? When you didn't do it to the least of these. You didn't do it to me. Now, are they getting cast into hell because they didn't feed somebody? No, they didn't feed somebody because their heart wasn't right with God. Were they going to heaven because they fed somebody? No, they fed somebody because their heart was right with God. It was the chicken or the egg thing. They're not getting rewarded with heaven because they went out and did good deeds. They went out and did good deeds because they were on their way to heaven because Jesus was Lord of their life. He's going to ask you not about what you ate, but about what did you do? How did you share what God blessed you with? Number eight, I don't believe the Lord will ask how much money you made. What was your income? Three figure, four figure, five figure, six figure, seven figure? What, how much money did you make? He may say something like, how much of a difference did you make with what you had? How much of a difference did you make? Small income, big income. It does. Jesus said one time, if you offer a cup of cold water in my name, you'll in no wise lose your reward. Well, yeah, but I don't have the money. I can't do that. A cup of cold water? Who can't afford that? It's not a matter of what we give. It's a matter of how we give or do we give. What have you done with what I've blessed you with? I think he'll be much more interested in our self-worth than our net worth. Were you faithful to tithe and give offerings or did you rob me and hoard up everything that I blessed you with? What'd you do? Here's number nine that I just thought about in between services. I thought I'm going to throw one more in real quickly. I don't think God's going to ask you about how talented were you. Never heard you sing a solo. You never got up and preached. I didn't hear you teach anything. I mean, what, what, you, what, you, you, didn't have, you didn't have anything. You didn't do anything. I don't think God's going to ask us about how talented we were. I think God may ask us about what we did with what he gave us. See, he'd given everybody something. He said, every man's got a measure of faith. He's put gifts and talents in there. What he told us to do, he didn't say, I'm going to do that. He said, you do. Stir up the gifts that are within you. Some folks got a gift of cooking. I mean, they can just cook. Miss Linda Broom here? Miss Linda here? Probably so. She's probably home cooking. That woman can cook. She can just cook. She can cook fried chicken that'll make you hurt somebody. She can cook. She's got a gift of cooking. You know what? When somebody passes and we have a repass here at the church, guess who's up there cooking food or bringing food in? She's using what God gave her. Some people, some people have a gift of, of making money. There are people who just know how to make money. They, they know how to make money. They can just, you know, it's one of those, the world calls it a Midas touch. I call it a Holy Ghost touch, man. They just, everything they touch turns to gold. And, and what are you doing with the gift God's given you? Some people can sing. Some people can speak. Some people can, you know, nobody does hedges like David King does. I mean, you look at the hedges out by the church. They let little circles around them. And David's out there with a pair of scissors cutting those things. What, have you, what are you doing with what God has given you? These are the kind of things I think God's going to be interested in after this. That's what we're going to be held accountable for after this. We get a lot of focus on this. How much money I'm making now. Where I live now. 
how my house is now, what I drive now, what I'm going to eat now, what I'm going to do now. Can I sing now? Can I? That's, a lot of, that's a lot of now. But I think we need to give some thought to after this. To whom much is given, much is required. Much is required. What have you been given? What have you been given? What have you been blessed with? What are you doing that when we stand before God, you say, you know what? I believe I'm going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I may not have done everything right, but I believe I did well with what I had. I believe I took what God gave me and I used it to the best of my ability for God's glory. Amen. I'm done. Again, we're so incredibly glad you decided to join us here today at Church on the Rock. I pray that this message touched you in a way that only God can get the glory from. If you would like more information on our church and our ministries, you can go to JesusTheRock.org. While you're there, consider giving us a financial donation by clicking on the donate button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us and have a very blessed day.